Welcome to the Pitchin' and Sippin' Podcast, where we talk PR trends and tips over sips and meet a wide range of incredible founders, PR pros, and members of the media. I'm Lexi Smith, a former workaholic VP of PR and marketing turned two-time entrepreneur, founder of the PR Bar Inc., business and PR coach, new mama, and self-proclaimed connoisseur of puns, pizza, and wine. I'm a huge believer that knowledge is power and kindness never goes out of style. Think of this show as a way to up-level your business and career over happy hour. Now let's get to pitching and sipping. Nicole Pearl is a former national magazine editor turned on-air beauty, fashion, and lifestyle expert known as the beauty girl. She's written for countless magazines such as Marie Claire, Allure, Health, InStyle, Birdie.com, and Parents, to name a few. She regularly appears on local and national TV shows, sharing the latest trends, tips, and products to try. She also tries to serve as a spokesperson and host for a variety of events, ranging from an industry conference to celebrity book tours. Her mantra is, beauty shouldn't be a bitch, and neither should be getting on TV. Tapping into her 25 plus years of experience, she launched her PR and media consulting business during the pandemic, which you will learn more about in today's show. So Nicole, welcome officially to the show. I'm super excited to have you. We're going to talk about so many things. But first, where is home base and what do you like to do outside of work for fun? Woohoo. Glad to be here coming to you from Chicago. That's my home base. And outside of work, I love to dance. I love hip hop. I love, I just got into pickleball. So I'm having fun with that. I'm also a mom of three. So they keep me busy. Okay. Is pickleball trending? Because I have had two or three people within the last few weeks say they've taken up pickleball. It is trending. It's so fun. It's like, (laughs) We work so hard, especially I feel like if you're an entrepreneur and you just want to take a moment to have some time and know you're going to laugh because there's just things about it that are absolutely ridiculous. So I just like that's kind of my time to zone out and know that I'll just kind of get that free space, have a few laughs and feel refreshed. It's like a mental break. And I, I, my husband and I were talking about this the other night. We don't even know where we go to try it, but we totally added it to our couple's bucket list. All right, I'm assuming there's specific, I mean, is it like a tennis court or do you need a specific pickleball court? You need a pickleball court and they're popping up everywhere. And in terms of, it's so funny talking about like the press and things like that, it's super trendy and hot. So if you have any, your if you have your like tentacles, anything within the pickleball arena, like this is a good time for you to get some exposure on your business. <laughs> okay, hot tip. Okay, and then kiddos, how old are your kids? I have three kids. My oldest is 11. That's a boy. I have a 10-year-old boy and then I have a six-year-old girl. So the first two, you did two under two. You're 202. And just to bring awareness, my oldest, who is 11, has type 1 diabetes. And so if anyone's listening and is a parent of or knows somebody of, I'm really active in the community and I'm definitely always trying to be a resource. So please know I'm available for any sort of like support wherever you are in your journey because it's really intense. We've kind of been through, it's been a nightmare and we've come out on the other side. And now I'm like kind of here to help and support and guide anyone that needs it because it is um, a 24 seven, you know, job. It's like having a fourth kid within having three kids. So when did you find out at what age did you guys Rex just turned six years old is when he got diagnosed. It's kind of a crazy story and it was intense And when they're super little and they don't understand why they're starting to get pokes and all kinds of pricks. And just the other day, you know, they never had to get those shots. It's really hard for young kids to understand when they kind of had like the life before diabetes and then they have to accept a new life. But he's doing great and thriving and it's really made him a really resilient kid. So there's definitely some, you know, highlights and lessons learned that I know he'll take and it will, he'll flourish because of it. Well, thank you for extending that lifeline on this show. And guys, you know, I'll include all of Nicole's information. So beyond PR and beyond media, um, 
listen to that if that's applicable to you and, and reach out. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear he's thriving. Um, I can't even imagine that journey. My daughter's only 16 months. So I'm, I'm, I still feel new in mine. Um, but I can only imagine how hard that is as a parent. So well, even though my oldest is 11, I still feel new too. So I totally get it. And you know, as mom for like next 10 years, <laughs> but as parents, whatever you do, what you have to do, you know, people are like, Oh, I could never do it. And I'm like, well, you know what, if it happens, you, you do it and you make it work and you figure it out. Cause that's just who we are. So making it work and figuring it out. Okay. So I read a condensed iteration of your bio. You have an incredible background and an incredible career. And what I'd like to do is go over the quote cliff notes version up until today. So when did you enter the world of media and what did your path look like? I entered the world of media as this really, you know, hungry yet naive person just received my master's and it was right after 9-11. So that was an interesting time. But I basically, you know, hustled and made my way through by starting out at, you know, Us Weekly was one of my first jobs. This was in the heyday. Oh boy, do I have stories. I basically read the manuscript of The Devil Wears Prada while I was working essentially in a very equivalent job at Us Weekly. So that's back in the day. And then I made my way where I eventually found my way as a beauty editor on staff. And I've written for or worked at a ton of magazines, fell into the beauty world, loved the women's lifestyle space, transitioned into becoming a full-time freelance writer when I you know, left New York and then evolved again and pivoted when I started the beauty girl business originally as a blogger, then got into TV and just fell in love with it. So now, you know, 20 years later, in terms of the editorial side, I still freelance and I do a lot of TV work, whether I'm pitching my own segments and talking about the latest trends, or I partner with brands, I host events, you know, I speak on panels. It's really it ranges because as an entrepreneur, it's like new opportunities come every day. That's kind of the beauty of it. And then I know we kind of briefly mentioned your newest venture, but you launched another iteration of your consulting during the pandemic. Can you share a little bit more about that? Definitely. This completely happened by accident. So basically, I'm sure many people listening were also on Clubhouse at the time of the pandemic. And I kept on hearing a lot of people on Clubhouse. I At that point, I was kind of positioned as a media expert on Clubhouse and holding a lot of rooms. And a lot of people were asking, like, how do I get featured? How do I get more press for my business? How do I show up on camera? And these consistent questions. And then I would listen to other people offer guidance and advice that frankly, for me, who's in the trenches, I knew it was the wrong information. I couldn't stand behind it. I didn't want these people to invest in the wrong direction. And and I got I, I just had to speak up. So I said, you know what? I'm starting this business within 48 hours of announcing that I am now going to help small business owners learn how to get yourself featured in the media because not everybody has the budget or is in the place where they're ready to hire PR. Um, I announced that I was doing that and I and I was profitable. I had clients within 48 hours of doing it because I noticed the white space and I love doing it. I love helping, you know, I believe, I'm sure you do, you know, we got to even the play, playing field. Everyone deserves to have hear their have their message heard. And so many people just don't know where to start, where to begin. So I'm now leveraging my 25 years of being in the media and essentially everything that I do to pitch myself, to get myself on the Today Show, to get myself, you know, featured in a magazine and, and all that stuff. I'm basically now passing it on from a media insiders kind of perspective, like the journalist's experience and perspective, and providing access in a way that people didn't have before. And so that's what this new iteration of my PR and consulting business, that's how it was born. I have to ask, do you remember some of the bad advice that you were hearing during the clubhouse days that you were like, ah, I twitch, no. <laughs> that was a really good question. And what some people were doing, were advising them to, the first thing you need to do is, and they were saying, invest in creating like an extensive media kit. And while I do think that 
sure, there is a purpose in place at times for Media Kit. Honestly, like I've completely had so much success. I partner with brands. I land my own speaking opportunities. And the one or two times that, let's say, I've been asked for a media kit, I can respond and say, here are my stats. I don't need a media kit like that. I don't, I believe you need to do what you can, you need to be as productive and do like income generating activity first in a way. And I don't think that's that. So like, that was one of the pieces of advice that I just didn't agree with. Um, And like other, they were giving ways to pitch and how to go about it. And it was just not, it was clearly people that thought they knew what to do, or maybe they were going from their own personal experience, but some of the wins that they had were like, honestly, flukes. So not something that was super replicatable. Yeah. Okay. So let's go into your mantra again. I'm going to read it. So beauty shouldn't be a bitch and neither should be getting on TV. I love that. Also, sorry, little ears. It's okay. Um, So (laughs) I'm so here for that. Let's talk about some good advice. You have extensive experience and you've been very, very successful having pitched yourself on two segments and serving as an on here host. And I know you've also helped clients do the same. So if you want to, let's let's approach this from two different ways. First, for the small business owner or the coach or the consultant or the expert or thought leader who wants to get on air, where can they start? How do they do it? The first thing that you should be doing is identifying where you want to be on air. And I know a lot of people have sites and want to be on national TV, which is great in theory. But I think sometimes your best return is being on your local TV show. I know people talk about it all the time, but that is not only going to allow you to prep the best, but that's going to literally hit the market of people that are going to get to know you first. So I think going local, number one. Now, the thing that's really cool, although a lot of places have gone back to in-studio, we do still have some opportunity for virtual. And so if you can easily get yourself, you know, lit and a simple kind of background, and I can go into all those details about how to pull off a virtual segment. I That was like what I did all throughout the pandemic. But suddenly you have no access to all these other markets that you could be doing TV segments, getting in, in front of them. That's almost more valuable sometimes than jumping into national because you really do want to make sure that you nail your messaging, you feel comfortable, and you reach like the community of people that truly are going to hire you or buy from you. Buy from you. Yeah. So let's start with local. Who? Okay. I am. My name is Pam and I want to be on my local TV. Where do I go? Do I go show up at the local TV station's door? Can I find a website? Who am I reaching out to and what am I saying? Definitely the first like pieces of advice is zero in on the show that let's say is your first choice and watch it. Go on their social media, start following the show, start following some of the anchors, Go on their website. What people don't realize, because I call it like sleuthing the source, is that there is so much like opportunity available now to find your contacts without having to pay for expensive databases. So oftentimes the website will have a contact number. Worst case scenario, you like actually pick up the phone and call the news desk. There's a lot of creative ways that you can easily access contacts or even like figure out what email formulas could be. One of the kind of perks that I have is because I do have a lot of media friends. If somebody is like, okay, I really want to get here. I might be able to personally, if I don't have the contact, find the contact through my network. Um, But it's so doable. I feel like people think, you know, maybe TV, it feels intimidating. I can't do that, but it is so doable once you kind of learn just like the few tips that you need to do to get there. Also, Luthing the source I'm obsessed with. I've always joked and called it professional stalking, but I love your <laughs> way of saying it so much better. And it sounds actually way less, way less creepy. Okay. So you're going to sleuth. Are we sleuthing for a anchor? Are we sleuthing for a producer? What contact should we be reaching out to if we want to get on TV? Ideally, the producer is in terms of TV, 
not great. They're the ones that are literally booking the talent. Sometimes there, there's a, a, it's either producer, sometimes it's called the booking producer. Um, there's also the executive producer. That's usually the person that is the, you know, top boss, so to speak. And depending on the size of the show, you're sometimes better off going to a producer or associate producer versus the executive. But here's the deal. Not all producers are, uh, you know, findable. And that's okay because it it's certain local shows. A lot of anchors are also responsible for pitching segment ideas or bringing content to the table for their meetings. So start following those people and you can always pitch to them too in, a, in an appropriate way. And I would never recommend just randomly you know, emailing somebody and be like, hey, here's an idea for you. I mean, there's got to be a slight warm up to it. So you don't come off as this kind of creepy person. Is the warm up something you can achieve through social media? Or what if you don't necessarily have access to an immediate warm up? Social media is a great place to start. Yeah. It's just kind of like that friendly, oh, this name looks familiar. Or somebody's engaging in my content or, you know, somebody's watching the show. It's just so you, there's potentially that familiarity. So that's why I'm like, even if you follow them, and I think that we're all so ego driven that a lot of people are noticing like, who's, who are my new followers today? Who's commenting on my posts? Like there's, there's no way that people within the media are not noticing this. So just remember that because that will help you become a little bit more memorable or stand out a little bit more. Do you know that I send out a community newsletter roundup every Tuesday, chock full of resources, free media kit downloads, event invites, journalist contacts, visibility opportunities. Basically, if you're not on the list, hit pause and sign up. It's super simple. Go to theprbarinc.com slash newsworthy. That link is in the show notes. Okay, back to the show. Great advice. Okay, I find my person. Her name is Susan Smith. I'm sitting down. What do I need to put in the pitch? Do I need to send her a video of myself? Or what does a TV pitch look like? Which might be different than a magazine or digital. They are different. That's a really good point. Because obviously readership is different from viewership. And so a lot of producers are thinking visually and all pitches need to be short. And of course, your goal is to tease and whet their appetite and get their attention. But I do think it's really important that you get to the point in your pitch and you let them know, for example, what type of segment do you see? If you do the homework for them, they will appreciate that. If you show that you know their formats or you know the type of content and you know how they, you know, how long their segments are, you need to show familiarity with that specific show. So you don't come across as like sending a generic pitch to them, you know, and just hoping they bite. I mean, it needs to be personalized. Such great advice. I, on the other side, because there was a, a brief moment in my life where I thought I wanted to be on camera and I interned for um, Studio Six, which was a morning show for CBS in Portland, Oregon. Any Hoosers, we had a lifestyle-based show that had a very specific flow. And one of the jobs I had as an intern on that show was filtering through all the different pitches. And it was so clear who actually watched the show and who didn't. And when pitches came through, that told me like, I have a five minute segment idea. Here's, you know, the visuals of what would be involved, etc. They were making me look real good as an intern. So even if you're not pitching the intern, I think that same concept still applies in, in making their life easier. So should you be providing, if it's not a media kit, what are there any additional assets for TV that you should be including in that pitch? I think it's really important. And this is why I say don't start out with nationals until you've had local is because basically think about this. A producer is going to put their reputation on the line by booking you. And if you end up sucking on air, it makes them look really bad. So if you do have any sort of on-air work, always great to include those links. If you, how about this? If you are not showing up on your social media on camera right now or yet, then we got to get you doing that. Because 
they're going to want to check you out before they put you on air and see your face on camera and how you present yourself. That is the number one thing. So you definitely need to at least let them know that you've done TV or include a link to your Instagram, something so they know that they're going to look good by booking you essentially. And are you in that pitch giving them just an idea and some key talking points or beyond the assets, what core information and the familiarity, what core information should you be painting for them in that pitch? You basically want to lay out what content you can provide and like basically how are you going to help or educate or entertain their viewers. And you need to include your credibility as well. And your credibility doesn't have to be, again, that you've been on the Today Show. Your credibility just has to show that you're an expert in your field. So many people these days are calling themselves experts. And now the media has become super skeptical because you need to be, you know, there's a difference, I think, between an expert and a thought leader. And it's kind of like, you need to show that you're a thought leader rather than so to speak, even though like I'm called an expert, you need to show your thought leadership abilities or credibility to show that you, you really are leading in this space and you truly have that knowledge. Yeah. It's like, you have to be an expert with also a unique point of view or leading with thought to -hmm. stand out. Okay. So we start local. We're doing great. We're ready for the next level or the big leagues is the process of landing a national TV segment the same? Does it differ? Or what advice would you have to give? Once you kind of really own and and master the skill set of pitching, it's very similar. I think it's the idea, the other things that come into play are like kind of building those relationships and how to stand out. There's a lot of little nuances, which is why I feel like in theory, yes, there is a pitch formula and I have one and I teach it. But no two pitches are alike. So once you nail the formula, there's slight nuances that are going to give you the advantage between pitching one show and the other. Um, But I do think that I work just as hard on my pitches for local and even my segments. It's the same work goes into it. It's the same skill set, you know, but as you get more experience, you have bigger stages to showcase yourself on. Now, I'm not going to ask you to give away all the meat and potatoes of your secret sauce. Okay, guys, if you want all the meat and potatoes, hire her. But do you have one little appetizer? I don't know why we're going food here. We're going food here. Do you have an appetizer or, you know, a dessert moment or something you can share about way, how you can stand out, that pitch can stand out in an inbox? Is it with the subject line? Is there something you want to share in the body or one part of the formula? Well, you did mention the subject line, and that truly does matter. And I'll give this to you, not only for TV, but pitching in general, because again, my background is an editor. I still get, I mean, my my email, I'm getting pitches now. And I use my inbox as essentially like my database. So let's say I want to pitch a segment on a certain topic. Well, I'm going to go to my email the first place and I'm going to search, let's say you're a health expert in, you know, a specialty of, I don't know, plant-based food or something like that. So if you include, you know, health expert and like plant-based nutrition or food and maybe, or if it's like fall, you know, trend story. So you want to keep it generic enough so that the next time I'm working on a health story, you come up when I search health, but slightly specific so that you're just not one of a hundred health experts pitching me. So yeah. that's kind of my piece, which I'm sure you already know this, but the subject line, you know, it's not a throwaway. It actually really matters because before I open your email, I look at the subject line and I determine based on like what my deadlines are and, you know, am I familiar with this person? Like those are all things that come into like, there's a million. It's funny because you think you just have to click open the email, but open the inbox, but there's probably like five invisible bullet points that you need to pass for me to then open that email. And again, it's not because I'm anyone special. It's just that people, you know, there's so many stories to, to ruffle to kind of 
figure out and go through that you have to prioritize. Otherwise, you won't get any of your work done if you're just checking email all day. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and you sh- you're you doing all the things. You're a human being. You have a lot on your plate. And I, I like to remind people sometimes that journalists are people too, believe it or not. And they are spouses and partners and moms and friends. And beyond their actual workload physically, they, they have things going on. So it's a good reminder. I think keyword stacking too is, is really, really key. I do want to flip and talk a little bit about your preferences, your personal preferences on the pitching side. So you just gave some really, really great advice to gen- not like generally speaking and how to land a local segment or a national segment, get on TV. I want to do rapid fire with you a bit and just go through what you like and what you don't like to be pitched if you are down. I'm down. Let's do it. I've, I've yet. I always ask if you're down and I'm like, what if someone says no? Does the podcast just end? Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, no right or wrong answers here, just what you prefer. Is there a certain day of the week you prefer to be pitched? Uh, so people say, and I have theories and all this stuff, but honestly, I think if it's an awesome pitch, I'll take it any day of the week. That's my own philosophy. If I was telling somebody okay, here's how to have a slight bit of advantage. Sure, do I have thoughts? But now I'm like, everybody's using that. So would you really stick out? I, but so it's a yes and a no. I mean, for me, no, but I mean, here, how about this? Don't pitch somebody at five o'clock on a Friday, you know, okay. unless well, it's like- you Don't you pitch do. you on five o'clock on a Friday too, is what I'm hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about that? Is there a time of day for you- Okay, that's for me. Yeah, for you, you will be more likely to see the pitch. Probably the morning hours between like 8.30 and 10. Okay. Floods and trees, do you like them or no? So like a sentence or two proving they've seen your work or just something other than the immediate pitch. If it's not forced, and it's genuine. Yes. Do I need somebody to be like, Oh, I just saw your segment and I loved it. I'm like, okay, I see right through that. You know? Yeah. Fair enough. Follow-ups. Can people follow up with you? Uh, okay. How about this? A hundred percent. And I feel like, especially if you are following up with me in the right way, I will be more likely to respond, even if it's like a no for right now, because I appreciate your consistency. But if you email me every day being like, did you just get my email? Did you just get my email? Then it's kind of, I, I there, you know, that's not like how I'm going to, I don't think that's the best use of your time. <laughs> what would be the right way? You said the right way to follow up. What does the right way look like for you? I think it's adding some new information or like, if you didn't like this angle, what about this angle? Um, and again, it's like the human touch. I feel like sometimes people forget, and I know for a fact, because it's happened with my clients, a lot of times people feel like if you don't hear back from someone, it means they're not interested, but people will be like, I totally, hello, I a hundred percent miss emails, a hundred percent. And how about this? Had I not followed up, I followed my method and sent a cold pitch to land Taylor Swift tickets through and anyway i followed up and they responded and i landed the tickets at face value friends and family because i followed up so this is like something not only for pitching anything it's like pitching yourself for anything i mean i was pitching myself to land tickets you know yeah good point so especially for your blog or for anything you're doing product based in the beauty industry do you require the product to be set up on an affiliate link program No, but I, and one other thing, and I don't know if you were going to ask this, but a lot of people will be like, write about this product without having seen it, or, you know, we'll send you product in exchange for, and as a professional writer who is in the beauty space, I'm not going to write about a pro like me testing out the product is me doing research. It's not like, Ooh, I got free free product. So I, that's really important too. For okay, if so they need to give you product so you can speak about it honestly, and then but and they don't need affiliate links. Not for not for me. 
not for you. What about for your freelance? Depending on certain magazines, but a lot of times, interestingly, freelance, unless the editor says, then it doesn't matter. You could like write a story and then they'll put in the products. So like I could write a story with tips and then the staff commerce editor, whoever it is, will then fill in the products based on my tips. And are you open to being pitched directly from a founder or do you prefer only to be pitched by publicists? Both. I'm all for founders pitching themselves. I think there's so much value in that, especially if you are a small business owner. I think that's a million reasons why that will benefit you for now in the long run. And then the most important question of this entire show is what can we find you sipping? So what's your favorite (laughs) beverage, alcoholic or non-alcoholic? It's summer. So I have to say an Aperol spritz. Oh, okay. Our producer, I know right now listening in, Kaylee, wasn't that your, I can't see you, but I'm pretty sure that was your, yes, it was your signature drink at your wedding. That's one of her favorites too. Oh, fun. Yeah. I love that. Yes. See, I remember that. Yes. Um, <laughs> Kaylee's wedding, this is a quick squirrel and then I'll, I'll bring us back. But my producer of the show is also my assistant. And the first time I ever met her in person was at her wedding. Just shows the, the virtual wow. world that we live in, which is wild. So That's I had cool. April spritz that night. I remember it well. It's also my first night away from my daughter. Okay. So <laughs> enough about weddings. I would like to wrap us up with where people can go to learn more about you, to connect with you, and how to work with you. You can go to NicolePearl.com. And there you also can get my free Get on TV guide. So you can download that. And you could also go to my Instagram at Nicole Pearl Beauty Girl. Send me a DM. I want to hear from you. I also offer free discovery calls so you can do that and we can connect. And, you know, I'd love to learn more about you, your business and your goals. Reach out to her, guys. Let her know that you saw her on this show. Thank her for all the incredible advice. She literally just gave you a step-by-step guide on how to pitch yourself on TV. So if you did not take notes during this episode, tap back, take notes. I will include all of her links in the show notes. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us today. And until next time, guys, on the Pitchin' and Sippin' Podcast. Hey guys, if you are enjoying the Pitchin' and Sippin' podcast, please do me a huge favor and leave a review wherever you are listening. If you want to connect with me to learn more about the PR Bar Inc., you can do so on Instagram at the PR Bar underscore Inc., or you can check out my website at theprbarinc.com. Cheers! Cheers!